Hey everybody, welcome back to The Fin Factor. I'm Paul. And I'm Aaron. This is episode number 95. 95. No Sharks player has worn 95, so we'll just kind of keep moving on. Maybe sometime in the future here. So uh, for this episode, actually, we have a very special interview, and it was specially requested to give a very formal and long-winded introduction. <laughs> um, <laughs> totally kidding, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Jonathan Becker, president of the San Jose Sharks. Hey, guys. Yeah, thanks for that. We're not even 30 seconds in, and you're already making fun of me. This is going to be a great episode. <laughs> going to be a good show. Exactly. Awesome. By, the, by the way, is that a special request that I give 95 to some player this year just to so you have it? Absolutely, but it'll be too late at that point. So <laughs> maybe, give, maybe give about 96 for our next show. We'll have someone. Yeah, there you go. Nice. Yeah, I think by that time, it'll be too late also. That's true. <laughs> what are you going to do when you roll over? <laughs> when I roll over? We'll start well, over again. Uh. <laughs> All right. Well, whatever. We'll cut at some point. Okay, so we're back here with uh, president of the San Jose Sharks, Jonathan Becker. Jonathan, is it John or Jonathan? Which way do you like? Uh, I go with Jonathan mostly, so let's stick with that. Okay, we'll go ahead and do that. Well, uh, I guess the first thing I wanted to do, and I know Aaron wants to get some background and get a couple questions going, and then we have some bigger things to talk about. But the first thing I wanted to go through was, you know, Doug Wilson as the GM. People know what a GM does sort of, um, you know, just by nature of the job. And I don't think that everybody really gets the the nature of what you have to do for the San Jose Sharks. So maybe just give a brief kind of rundown of what your role is with the organization before we kind of jump in. Well, if you want to be brief, it's everything that Doug Wilson doesn't do. Okay. <laughs> that probably doesn't help very much though. So, um, so if you look at the business ops side of it, it's basically the process of running our four buildings, right? Not just SAP Center, but Solar for America, Oakland Ice Center, the uh, Fremont Ice as well. Then it's all the business functions that support the running of the building, whether that's marketing, whether it's sales, whether it's finance, legal, et cetera. If you think of a normal company, all the functions that a normal company has, you have in a sports team as well. Just normally you think of the hockey side. So we're business supporting hockey. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to get that out of the way so the fans that are watching uh, get a rule just for, you know, and an appreciation for what you do. So uh, go ahead, Aaron, go ahead and kick it off. By the way, the other fun thing I get to do is show up at NHL Board of Governors meetings and talk about the future of the NHL, but that's probably not interesting to fans. That's very interesting. I would love to hear more about that, actually. <laughs> um, but let's let's talk about you as you as a person before you even started this job. You were a CEO of a few a handful of companies beforehand, yeah, um, and it was in the early 2000s. So you kind of seen two market crashes for, I guess, for uh, the the tech world in a way, and survived uh, and and thrived. Um, why do you have to start with a negative market crash? What we <laughs> it's not negative. It's just you. It's great. I mean, I was, we both survived through that time as well. I was working in banking at the time when it happened, so uh, that was that was quite the odd odd time. Uh, but you started working at SAP in two thousand nine and kind of worked your way around. And then I had a question about um, being at SAP and now moving over to the present of not just sharks, but sports and entertainment. So you're kind of encompassing everything. Yeah. Um, did you work with Hassel Platner and all? Was that kind of a reason that you moved over to the sharks? Did you have some kind of introduction there? Yeah, that, that's exactly it, as it turns out. That's how he know me. He knows me or I know him, depending which process was. Nice. So as you said, I had lots of senior roles at SAP after they acquired my startup. One of them was chief marketing officer. So in fact, the reason that the building was named SAP Center is I negotiated it on behalf of SAP uh, with the Sharks, on the other hand. And I spent a bunch of time getting to know how the business works. I actually built a business in selling technology to sports teams. We did deals with the NFL, with the NHL, with women's tennis, did deals with the 49ers here in the Bay Area with the Sharks, et cetera. So I got to learn a lot about how the business side of sports teams work. Along the way, I got to know Hasso better not just from a technology point of view, because of his love of the Sharks. Got to watch a number of games of them as well, including several during our big conference in Orlando called Sapphire. So when I left SAP now three and a half years ago, he actually called me up and asked me if I want to do this job. And I said, yes, even before he finished his sentence. <laughs> That's really cool. I mean, getting to work, uh, that would be a dream job for me. So this is kind it, of- It is guess. definitely my dream job. No yeah. question about it. We've kind of made our own sort of dream job doing this show, but 
getting a little bit of the inside info. It's a lot of fun. Um, so did you become a Sharks fan during that time or was it because you were kind of in the Bay Area beforehand um, working in your other job. So did you get to know the Sharks then? Because you're a graduate from both University of Virginia and Duke University for your mm-hmm. master's, right? So you kind of were on the East Coast more than on the West Coast. Yeah. In fact, I grew up not far from I-95 and this okay. is the 95th episode. See what I did there? I tied ah, that. Ah, yeah. It all ties in. Nice exactly. work. Yeah, well done. So, in fact, yeah, I grew up in what most people consider basketball country, right? Mm-hmm. In and around all that. And, yes, of course, basketball fan. In fact, I watched a lot of hockey growing up, but I'm not a very good hockey player. But I fell in love with the game actually when I came to Silicon Valley. And amusingly, it was a pretty important year for hockey. It was 1993. I saw the third ever game in the Shark Tank. Sadly, wow. never got a chance to see the Cow Palace as well. Uh, and loved going to games, saved up money, didn't have very much money back then. And went with a bunch of friends. And the more I did better, the more we were able to split season tickets. So I think in 99 actually was the year I first became a partial season ticket holder, split with like a group of eight or 10, and then kind of grew from there. And I got my own season tickets probably in 13 or 14, sometime around there. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, I've been a fan for 20 plus years, even though I've only been part of the organization for three. That's Although I'll tell you, the downside is you get to see less hockey now. Yeah. I mean, I'm busy working on game nights, so I miss an awful lot of the game. And I go home and I want to see the highlights, which is weird. So a hockey game lasts like five hours for me now. rather than <laughs> uh, You weren't missing much in the Cow Palace days, believe me. It's Fair enough. Terrible. Although I would have liked to have seen Doug Will- Wilson skating around without a helmet on. That would have been fun. Yes, that was, that was probably the coolest part. Yeah. I think the two games that I went to at the Cow Palace, I mean, I was a kid. I don't think Doug Wilson was playing because he, he was hurt for a lot of those games. So he, right. he missed out a lot. So I didn't get to actually see him play. But, yeah, Kelly Kissio was the main guy when I went to those games. Yeah, I've done the history thing, so that's right. Yeah. And then by year, by 93, everyone was yelling, Falu! Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I kind of learned that year. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. <laughs> by the way, uh, based on conversations I've had, there were something like 60,000 people in the Shark Tank when Jamie Baker scored that famous goal because everyone I know says they were there live. <laughs> I, I wish I could tell you I was in the building that night, but I wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't there either. I was too little. <laughs> so much for capacity of being 17.5 or whatever it was back then, but everybody yeah. says they were there. Right. <laughs> cool. The, the the next thing we wanted to kind of move to here was the, and it's kind of the big topic, is the the whole ordeal with the city of San Jose and the 10 to 15 years worth of construction that was uh, sort of planned but not really communicated. It seems like there was a whole lot going on there. I know you've talked a lot. Uh, about this uh, in in other articles, other other uh, media venues and whatnot. But if you could kind of just kind of give us the latest on that situation, kind of maybe what was maybe going wrong. I know you reached out to fans asking for help, and we can certainly see how fans can help uh, a little bit after this little segment here. But um, maybe just give a rundown of that and the latest information that you have. Yeah, I, I guess I, uh, I did a pretty good job of getting the word out in the last couple of weeks. There's certainly been a lot of TV, radio, press, et cetera. So the short version, let me make sure that we talk about what we're not doing first before we talk about what we're doing. This is not a way of trying to get a new arena. We love SAP Center, Shark Tank. It's uh, 30 years old, but we can easily get another 30 years out of out of it. We're not trying to get more money from the city. We're all set there as well. That's not what this is in disguise. In fact, mostly what it was, was to educate people that care about downtown San Jose. There's a lot of stuff happening. 250 acres are being redeveloped. And in general, that's a really good thing. BART is coming to downtown. In general, that's a really good thing. Caltrain is probably being modernized. Could be a really good thing. High-speed rail might come from Southern California to us. That could be a good thing as well. The problem is all this is happening, and it's really complicated. There's more. There's several thousand pages of documentation out there about the changes that are going to happen. And you said 10 or 15 years. My guess is more like 20 or 25 years. And so our first goal is to make sure that people understand what's happening because it's confusing. So it's an education process. If you want to learn more about what's going on, there's a website we created called thefutureofsapcenter.com. Feel free to go check that out and read it more details. And in general, all this stuff is great. It's good. Having more people in downtown San Jose is good for us. It's good for the city. There are three challenges, though. One is... A lot of the street network is being changed, and in particular, the streets are being narrowed. 
So Santa Clara Street, which I think everyone knows, the main east-west thoroughfare, which is currently four lanes of traffic, is going to go down to two lanes of traffic for cars. And that can be difficult then to get in and out. Same thing is happening to Autumn and Montgomery Street as well. So that means that downtown is going to be more heavily reliant on walking and bikes, which might be okay if public transportation picks up. Right now, only 10 to 15% of people use public transportation to get to the SAP Center. We hope many more people do, maybe as many as 50%. But we worry about those fans that live in areas that don't have public transportation yet. Parts of San Jose, Morgan Hill, Gilroy, Los Gatos, Saratoga, Stockton, parts of the East Bay, et cetera. So we wanna make sure there's at least some capacity to drive. We don't want everybody to drive, that makes no sense. We want as much use of public transportation as possible. 50% would be great. I think that would make us the number one venue in North America in terms of public transportation, but it's probably not gonna be 100% anytime soon. There are also some issues with number of parking spots for those, but I think those are gonna get worked out over time. The other big issue is with five large construction projects for 20 or 25 years, there needs to be some kind of central coordination. That's what the city needs to do. And that's really what we're asking, which is each project on its own makes total sense. But if they're not centrally um, coordinated some way, then each project's gonna shut down some portion of the city just for them. And if we're not careful, we might accidentally shut all four sides of the SAP center for months on end. Seems odd, but it could potentially happen unless this gets what's called a master plan. And I think the city has acknowledged they need a master plan. I think I heard coming out of the city council meeting last Monday, they plan to create one. I haven't seen it yet, but if we can solve these problems, then everything's hunky-dory and we move forward. Yeah, I think that that's going to be the major problem is, is construction is pretty much going to be going on for a very long time. I mean, That's it's right. going to be like the, the Boston's Big Dig. I don't know if you remember what that project was. I do remember was. that, indeed. That, yeah, that took forever. and everyone, It was like a big joke because it took so long. And it finally did finish, and it's fantastic. It is fantastic. Much, much better. Exactly. So, But uh, it's it's reminiscent of that because you know, and I'm not trying to talk smack about government or San Jose, but anything that the government says is going to take, it's going to double it. So it's going to take, they say 10, 15 years, it's going to be 20 to 30. Well, Just, you know. Things if you go do a bathroom remodel in your house and they tell you 12 weeks, it usually takes a bit longer than that as well. So Exactly. And there's always not, problems. Yeah. So, that's it's, right. it's, so, so we need to just stage these out since they're all going to take a long time and make sure they all should happen. We're pro every one of them, but just with a longer, which is why 10 to 15 years doesn't make any sense because mm -hmm. then they'd be on top of each other. It needs to. So it, the bad news is it's going to take longer. The good news is you can still access everything while they're happening. So what's a good uh, a good thing for Sharks fans to do? I mean, we, we mentioned the website. Does the website have contact information on there for them to reach out? It does. So if you go to the very bottom of that website, futureofsapcenter.com, it says how you can provide feedback to the city. And again, the feedback we want you to provide is, here are your concerns. Can you drive if you need to drive? Can you take public transportation? Do you want a master plan, et cetera? Or if you're pro this, that's good as well. This is a democracy. Have your vote and voice heard. This is just how you can learn more and give people feedback on what you want done. Perfect. So, Jonathan, as, as a fan and someone who's gone to many, many games. And wait, 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 time out. You're a fan? No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, did I say I that? I'm you. sorry. I missed both. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, look, I even got the teal background. Come on. <laughs> I thought you'd have to say super fan. It's super fan. Well, yeah, sure. I guess we could say super fan. We have the show. Why not? Okay. Power cells in the back a little bit. But, you know, time has come out of SAP Center and – uh, it's already crowded as it is. You're talking about them basically having the amount of lanes, right? So down from four to two and then Autumn Street down from two to one. Um, I was curious, would it be more beneficial if that traffic instead of stampeding out and the, and the SAP Center clears in 20 minutes, if that was drawn out over a longer period of time? Um, sort of saying, what if there was something at SAP Center to keep uh, the patrons there for a little bit longer for the fans to be able to go have you know they have that nice new bar uh was it citrix has the bar over there now just call it the south entrance bar that's okay south citrix is the suite is the penthouse suite area that's right just so so that south entrance bar that's over there it's it's nice and new and if you could have maybe kind of a late night crew that has people being served over there or maybe just 
you know, a specific venue that does food a little bit later on, something to keep fans there to kind of space that that traffic that's going out of SAP Center. Is that something that you guys have maybe thought about at all? Yeah, that's so you framed it really nicely. If you think about it, there's two problems. There's ingress, getting people in, and there's egress, getting people out. And one of the advantages of getting people in is you can stagger them over a long period of time, usually 90 minutes, although 50% of the fans still show up within 15 minutes of puck drop. So it's not as staggered as you think it is. But you can do things by happy hours, as you've seen us do, restaurants, et cetera, to get people to come early. The question is, can you get them to stay later, particularly in the light of liquor laws and restaurants being open? So part of the discussion with the city will be permission to keep certain venues open longer so that people could stay. So in fact, we right now have a 30 minute exit window. Maybe a well, one hour exit window would work better and because people are more likely to linger. The challenge is people will linger on a Friday or Saturday night or maybe a Sunday game, but on Tuesdays and Thursdays, Thursdays a lot of them want to get home because they have work the next morning. Fair enough. Yeah. Right. And if the game starts at seven, it's ending at 10. If it goes to overtime, it's 10, 20. You know, there's a limit to how long you want. We, we've experimented. You know, we've done some after game stuff. Dan Rusinowski sometimes breaks the game down for people as well. Some are interested, but particularly on family night, people want out of there as fast as they can. Yeah, I can see that. Good point. I- I could see the demographic maybe changing the fans a little bit it's once Google is, you know, the Death Star is operational and running all Did around it. They got Death Star? Yeah. <laughs> once, once all the Google employees are there and they're living downtown and, and probably a lot of them are going to buy season tickets and go um, to those games, we might start seeing like a younger, more tech crowd going that maybe would stay later because they live downtown and it's easier to just walk home. So, Certainly possible. Although... That, I think, I think you're now projecting what will be 15 or 20 years from now because most of their office buildings don't even break ground for three or four years, let alone populate people. Yeah, so we're talking about fans that probably are just being born right now. Which That's is right. Weird. So weird. Maybe, maybe we can teach them to skate so they become fans too. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's going to be weird. Uh, let's talk about uh, SAP, the building itself. So COVID happened. It's terrible. Everyone's yeah. kind of obviously we can't go to any games, can't do anything in the arena. But I think you guys did one of the smartest things you could have done. And not only doing upgrades, but you're also employing a lot of people that that need to work. So it was a great time to to the only time practically, hopefully the only time that this SAP center will be closed down for so long that you're able to do so much work. So could you go over kind of the upgrades that we that uh, happened? Yeah. So what what's that old saying? When life hands you lemons, try to make lemonade. That's kind of what we did. So, you know, March, April, I think most people had no idea the pandemic would last this long. There were a lot of discussions about, you know, back to play in June. I think people speculated, well, maybe July at the latest. So, you know, we hunkered down for a couple of months, just tried to figure out how to do remote work, pretty much like everybody else on the planet. But by June, it was clear it was going to take a lot longer before people could get back in the building. And so we said, this is an elongated time. What can we do now? It just would be not possible any other time because normally when we do off season construction projects at most, we have like eight to 12 weeks because even if we're not playing hockey, we got other events in the building, family events, concerts, et cetera. And one of the first things we realized, even though it was unbudgeted and under plan is the building itself, as you said, is coming up on 30 years old, which means the concrete was poured in the 91, 92 timeframe. And what if we not just replace the ring floor, but all the subflooring beneath that, all the pipes, think about doing a plumbing job for your house, but ripping out all that even underneath the pipes and the refrigeration plant, the ice plant that makes the ice. What if we just basically changed the guts of the building and made it all new again? Great photo of what that looked like as well. And of course that project is essentially a four and a half month project because once you actually do it, actually the new floor has to cure. It can't be touched for 30 days as well. That's what we're in the middle of doing right now. Well, we scrambled and we actually did a design. And what we discovered is so many construction people didn't have jobs because as you point out, there's not a lot of construction happening that we were able to move quite quickly and complete the project actually slightly ahead of time um, and employ hundreds of people in these jobs as well. And so we'll have a brand new rink floor. We'll go live basically the first or second week of December. We'll start making ice again. 
And we'll do this in a much more environmentally sensitive way than was available to do 30 years ago when we first do this. There used to be what's called a double header system, which means that you actually put in water on both ends to freeze and the pipes went there. Now it's a single header, which makes it more efficient. The pipes get wider, which means you can pump more through the system so it gets cold faster. So we'll have the best ice in the league right now. So all those believe it or not believe complaints about ice on those warmish days. And it turns out, by the way, temperature outside is not the primary issue, it's humidity. Mm -hmm. So when you have to worry about the ice is when the humidity goes up, not actually when the temperature goes up, those will be gone. We'll have great ice going for it. It's amazing. I remember when the Sharks put in the new dehumidifiers, probably around uh, early 2000s, I think it was. Uh, a bit later than that, I think it was 12 maybe. Oh, wow. I thought it was a lot earlier. I, just, I remember the ice was just choppy and bad on those days that were just, I don't know, it, it was not good. And there were a lot of complaints around the league about the ice. And you said it will be the best around the league. I feel like Edmonton always gets praised for their ice and how great it is. Fair enough. So yeah. I should probably say certainly the best in any warm weather environment. I probably won't try to compete with Canada ice. Well, I was going to say, would it be better as it going to rival Edmonton for the best ice? That'd, that'd be fantastic. And I think that would be a big draw for players to come play in San Jose is having some much better ice and a, a cleaner surface. It's going to be the puck's going to settle down more, which benefits higher skilled players than it does. skilled players. So, it's, so that's we, But that's certainly not all we did. On top of that, we did some other stuff as well. Some stuff that'll be obvious to fans when they come back in. Like, so if you walk in that south entrance, we talked about the bar that's right above that south entrance. Mm -hmm. Everyone remembers the escalator that you can walk up if you don't want to walk up the stairs. You may remember that that escalator has broken down a time or two over the last couple of years. So we pulled that escalator out and we replaced it. This is actually a, a fun project. It's another one that would have been hard to do if not for the shutdown. Because to actually pull the escalator out and to put the new one in in the way we want, we actually had to break through to the room underneath the stairs. Now, some of you may have been in that room. It's called the Frank Jurek Room. Uh, one of the guys that originally designed and built the building back in 91, 92, or FJ Room for short. And so if you'd been underneath, you could have actually seen the bottom of the escalator coming through. It was a fantastic view. And so now we have this brand new escalator, which is glass on the side, so you can see it, has lighting capabilities, and a few special features that will roll out over time. Oh, that's cool. So it's going to be some teal lighting, I imagine, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's, that's good. Good future proofing right there. That's awesome. And one more sort of thing that, again, most fans won't notice. So you've heard of the concept probably of a smart building or a smart home. Essentially, we did the same thing to SAP Center. We ripped out all the wirings, all the multiple controls, and we put in a modern control system, a building automation system, as it gets called in the lingo, which controls essentially from one system, although I'm oversimplifying it for effect, the lighting, the HVAC, the dehumidifier, the monitors, et cetera. So think of like a master mission control where you can, for good, of course, do the lights down, they say all that from one space. Most people won't notice it, but if you look really closely the next time you're seeing the building, you'll see these white rectangular boxes all over the place. Those are the sensors that are giving us feedback that allows us to, to be the smart building going forward. And also provides a couple of new special effects, shall I say. You're not gonna give us anything, are you? <laughs> uh, maybe the hint I will give you is our playoff light shows will be much easier to do whenever we wanna do them. That's cool. Maybe okay. without issuing bracelets even. Got oh. it. Going to have to show up to the games, folks. Check it out. It's going to be yeah. awesome. Good you have feeling. to be present to experience. Uh, actually, it's not true. You'll probably be able to see it on TV, but you should come in. It's a much better experience if you see it live. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. um, so we, we talked about some of the things happening with SAP. It all sounds phenomenal and amazing, and I cannot wait to get back into the building and check it all out. Um, however, the Barracuda building. Now, how much of that technology gets put into the Barracuda's new building? I know that that's broken ground and starting to come up now, right? Right. Oh, yeah, great snap. So I think people know that our practice facility is like seven miles away from the big building on 10th Street near San Jose State. It's been a four ice sheet facility so far. Um, Barracuda play in the SAP Center for now, and the practice facility is in there as well. We're extending the four sheet facility to a six sheet facility. 
The sixth sheet is going to be the new home of the Barracuda. So it comes with a, an arena, if you will, a 4,500 seat arena uh, where it will be the home of the Cuda. So we're building that to, so one extra practice for public sheet and the Barracuda arena as well to be named. By the way, maybe the Fin Factor guys should sponsor it. It should be called the Fin Factor Arena. A small amount of money if you guys want to do that. Tom, to check our budget. <laughs> uh, you know, check around on the couch. You might have some coin to actually want to do that as well. Um, in addition, you may or may not know that the South Rink, the one that the boys practice on, we did similar thing that we've done to the big building, which is we removed the ice. We replaced the underlying uh, uh, piping as well so that we'll get better ice in the practice facility as well. But the new arena has got a whole bunch of cool things in it, not of all of which we're willing to divulge yet. Um, one, I think I hinted on Instagram or Twitter, I don't remember right now, which is there's going to be a bar at ice level where you can actually drink and look, sit literally right behind the goalie, the home goalie. And there's going to be a bar where you can see out on the rink as well. It's like an open concourse, if you will. That's wonderful. It's kind of like uh, like being in Stanley's, except at ice level. So that's, that's exactly. uh, Really, really cool stuff. Yeah, it's another one that, you know, Aaron and I both have kids, and we've, we've enjoyed going to the Barracuda games, uh, bringing the kids there, um, even like the Teddy Bear Toss games and everything. It's always been a really good uh, experience, a lot of fun. But you you have heard the complaints about the Sharks playing on ice that wasn't uh, – it, it was bad ice because the Barracuda had played earlier in the day. This separates that problem out. On top of having better ice at SAP, you've also got the two teams not even sharing the same ice service when they're playing their home games anymore. So – um, again, it's just one of those things where, you know, I'm really excited to go in and check out the brand new venue and, and watch both teams playing. And, and sample all the special food and uh, drinks that we might have there as well. All right. Bring it on. What, what do you yeah, got? Because we have a couple of the food events and we love them. So uh, what else do you have? Are, are all the food things that are happening at SAP also being shuffled over? I can't imagine all of them will be. They won't be. We won't. It's just not as big of a venue. But yes, many of the same ones. And we'll have the same passion for food that we have there in the CUDA building. In fact, we're going to have it be even specially creative. I don't know if you guys went to the uh, Joey Chestnut uh, waffle. eating contest, the waffle eating contest. So we've got some local San Jose themed stuff in plan for when we open for the 22 season. Sounds great. Yeah. It, it's really a venue not to be missed. I'm biased of course, but I think <laughs> it'll be the number one AHL building in the, in the league on the day it opens. Wow. I mean, that's cool. Like the Sharks Arena is, uh, was it the third oldest in the league, second or third oldest? Yes. But it doesn't feel like it. It doesn't feel that way, does it? No. No, not at all. And and I feel like having, I mean, I don't know, I don't know Hasso per personally, but having a German owner, they don't like to just wreck buildings and build a new one. They like to just okay. keep it as was. I think he's, there was a quote of him saying that too. Like you Americans like to just demolish a building and build up a new one when the old one is just fine. So I feel like the building, the shell, Everything around it is great. The architecturally, I think it still looks beautiful. I and agree. Inside, you you took out all the guts inside and put a new one, so it's just give it a whole new life. You know, one of the reasons that it looks so good for a building its age. In fact, to me, it looks much younger than other buildings built ten years younger than it. We've invested more money in remodeling it than it cost to originally build in the ninety one to ninety three time frame. So, and, and over the next twenty years, we'll probably do it again. So, yeah. if you're constantly renewing something. As long as you say the bones are strong, then we can fix all the other stuff. We can always modernize that. And that's why things like building automation system, the guts, make it easier to make the building last longer. Right now, our lease is to 2040 as part of this deal with the city that we're working on. We hope to extend it dramatically longer. Excellent. So the Sharks will definitely be staying around in San Jose for the long haul. Let's hope so. We were born here. We grew up here. We want to stay here. Yeah, good. Absolutely. That was one of the weird things hearing that there was some, uh, some, uh, we'll say tension uh, between the Sharks and the city was that you guys had just pumped so much money into uh, refreshing that building. Um, it just seemed incredible that it would be something that you know, that drives you out when you guys have already invested so much. And, uh, you know, we've been here forever, you know, ever since the, yeah. the puck drop, well, other than the Cow Palace, you know, ever since the puck first dropped in San Jose is where we've been as a team. So, um, yeah, it would be really say, sad to see anything happen uh, to, to this team going anywhere else. I agree with you. That's when people say to me, it's a ploy to get a new building. I'm like, then why would I put so much money into this one if I want a new building? That doesn't yeah. really make any sense. Yeah. Some people don't think it all the way through, Jonathan. I don't know. But, uh, you know, something that was thought all the way through and looks phenomenal, the reverse retro jersey. 
I love this thing. I absolutely love this thing. It is phenomenal. Now, what's what was the process like in getting uh, this put together? I know you guys kind of had a bunch of things on the drawing board. What made this stick for you? So look, I mean, the first question you ask yourself if you're gonna build a reverse restro, and as you know, every team in the league did this. This was an Adidas and league sponsored initiative is, what year are you gonna reverse? And if you're a Sharks fan, your initial question is, uh, do you reverse the original jersey? Still one of the most iconic jerseys in sports, let alone in hockey. And I don't know, that felt a little bit like sacrilege to me. I mean, going back and changing that original jersey and tampering with it, uh, didn't feel right. And, you know, we just paid homage to during the 25th anniversary to that. So that was another reason that felt too soon to kind of mess with that again. So then we looked back and said, where's the first time we actually experimented? When's the first time we really had an alternate jersey? That was the 97, 98 season. And I know you, there was two variants there. And this one really stuck out with us. And we know we wanted to use the original logo. And if you look at that, we said, oh, do we do orange? Do we do black? Or do we do gray as the main color? And black didn't seem to make sense. We just did the stealth jerseys, which are extraordinarily popular, but why repeat it? And orange looked good, but frankly, it was too close to the CUDA. And it was a bit shocking. Uh, to be fair, I think uh, what New Jersey did a very Christmas tree kind of thing. So maybe we could have gotten away with it. But gray looked really cool, particularly I think our logo, our classic logo on that gray really made it pop. There was discussion about slightly lighter gray, slightly darker gray. We did play with that a bit. This felt like, the, and I've seen the controversy online. Some people wish it was darker, Some, bit, but you know, you, you just, it starts with what year and the 97, 98 seemed the, that was an important time in our franchise history. As you know, I became a season ticket holder the next year, which makes it even more important. No, I'm just kidding, of course. <laughs> Um, so you kind of you build it up and then you see different variations and this one just got all our votes. It, it was, you know, if my mental reaction was take my money, you know, the old uh, gif that people do and it felt right. You guys can get Owen Nolan to model it off for you. I, I think you can expect to see Owen in this jersey. Excellent. That's not me telling you when. I know. Yeah, that's a fan favorite, especially in that era. That's was, exactly right. There. He may have called an important shot during an all-star game or something. And he got robbed of the uh, first star of the all-star game. He did. That, that yes. I don't hold a grudge, but I think he deserved that. Definitely. Home team. Oh, I'm still bitter. I can't, I can't let it go. Eh, it might be time to let that one go. <laughs> well, uh, I, uh, I, I do have a stealth Jersey. I do have the orange uh, Barracuda Jersey, which I do love. Go pumpkins, uh, go traffic cones. Uh, it looks phenomenal too, but I, I do have to say, this is one of those moments I, I share the same sentiment, take my money, uh, 100%. I will be getting one of these things. It is, it's great. I, I can't wait to have this thing hanging up uh, in my closet. So uh, really good job. Cause you know, there's a lot of times where they'll come out with the Jersey and the fans are going, what are they thinking? And I don't want to dog any, any particular teams. But there's a couple of them that they, sorry, did you have a cough or what was that? Nothing in my throat. Yeah. Like a yeah. Uh, there, there's a couple teams that, it looks like a practice jersey. There's a couple of teams that went way out in left field. And actually, um, the who is it? The Arizona. I mean, they had the purple. I kind of liked it. It was way bold. Um, yeah. But then there were some teams that, I don't know, the colors just didn't seem to work. Sharks always seem to nail it. Uh, there's something about teal and then that gray uh, as the background for the original logo. It all just comes together so nicely. And I really have to congratulate you guys on such a really good mm -hmm. job of putting that jersey together. Now, what, what do they say on late night commercials? But oh, wait, there's more. Let's so, start. you know, that's uh, if you follow me on Twitter, not that you need to, you know, I started a little bit of controversy because some people are speculating whether it'd be a fourth. And then there was a discussion of, well, why only a fourth, a fifth? And I threw out, couldn't there be a sixth this year? <laughs> uh, I did see a couple of fans wondered if we would become the Oregon Ducks of the NHL and <laughs> play in a different jersey every night. I'm, I'm here to officially debunk that rumor. We are not going to do that. There is a limit to the number of jerseys. That's 41. We couldn't have more than 40. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I will say we're not done yet. There's, there is another one, another shoe to drop, if you allow me to say that. And there may be even a surprise on top of that. Excellent. I so did. that's not me saying six or five or four. That's me saying plus. Okay. You said there's another shoe to drop, and you won't tell us what. 
I'm cool with that. But can you tell us like a when we might be expecting the shooter drop? Um, in time for you to throw even more money at your favorite uh, holiday party. How about that? Perfect. Okay. So not too far distant future. Pretty soon. Well, we, to be fair, we, we're just still working through a couple of supply chain issues. Oh, by the way, here's another thing that I'll debunk. I've seen some people at me on social media saying this is just a ploy to, to manufacture some revenue when you can't sell tickets. I don't think people know how long it takes to design and manufacture jerseys. This process of this reverse retro started almost, no, more than 18 months ago. Wow. Um, and just the manufacture, forget the design, and imagine how much it takes to get 31 teams to coordinate on a release schedule and get the, I, oh yeah, right, we made this up in August and rushed it to March. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and so the other thing we're doing has some coordination issues with it as well. And if we can sort those out in the next couple of weeks, it'll happen sooner. Otherwise, maybe when the puck drops is when that'll drop. Okay. Hopefully before the season starts, but up until the season starts, there will be another announcement. Something like that. Okay. Although, I haven't told you when the season's, the puck's going to drop. How come you haven't asked me that yet? Going right into that question. Do you have any insight of when the season's going to start? I I do. Yeah, are you going to tell me? Come on. Oh, I Don't make me wait for it. Don't, Don't make me beg. Come on. <laughs> Um, actually, it's interesting. I've heard lots of people quote B Gary Bettman saying it's going to start on January 1. And it actually, if you go back and look at the original Bettman quote, he didn't say exactly on January 1. He said, we are targeting January 1 at the earliest start date because this was back in November. And so, yes, early January is when the season is hopefully going to start. But let's be fair. The number one criteria for this is health across the nation. And more than anything else, the challenge is, is there's not one place you play in, right? You play in all 31 teams. You know, people talk about how border crossings are an issue to getting from here to Canada, but it's not just that. There are state, interstate issues. For long periods of time, you couldn't get in and out of New York and then in and out of Jersey, et cetera. So that will govern more than anything else. The league has been very clear. They'd love to play an entire season if possible, all 82 games. But we also have to understand that in mid-July, there's a thing called the Olympics coming. And we don't really want to go past the Olympics if we don't have to. Now, final decision hasn't been made, but I, I'm comfortable that we're going to end up with, I mean, again, unless something bad happens, so please stay home for Thanksgiving and Christmas if you can, I'm relatively comfortable that we should be able to get going in January. Now, all that depends locally also on how Santa Clara is doing, right? And so can we play in our building? Can we play in front of fans? Can we, all that stuff to be determined, we'll follow health authorities. But the goal is to try to get something going in January, earlier if possible. Will Sharks masks be a giveaway at any of the uh, first games? Sharks masks will be abundant. How about that? That sounds good. Yeah, I mean, let's be fair. When fans are in the building, whether that's game one or game three or game 10 or whatever that is, it's likely at that point masks will still be required, right? It's There will be hand washing stations and sanitizer around and stuff like that. So. For the while, it'll look a little different than you're used to, right? We'll, you'll have different ways to get in the building. We'll have, you know, physically distant. I don't like the word socially distant because we want to be socially close, but physically distant. So there'll be some changes at first. Uh, maybe maybe a little scoop for you guys at late night here. All right. Um, one of the ways we're going to make things safer and speed up lines is we're going to limit cash in the building. So we're going to go to a process where cash isn't accepted for food and beverage and merchandise. Now, I know that not everybody has a debit card and not everybody has a credit card. So we're going to introduce, as far as I know, a first in hockey, maybe a first here in the Bay Area. I'm not entirely sure about that. We're going to create what I call a reverse ATM. Now, I think everybody here has used an ATM before, right? ATM, you put in your debit card, get out of cash. A reverse ATM does the other thing. You put in your cash, you take out a teal, Sharks focused debit card nice. that can be used not only in our venue, but any place that accepts a debit card. So if you show up with cash and we say, we know we don't take cash, you walk over to the ATM, the reverse ATM. It'll take a lot for people to get used to because it's the reverse to how you think of it. You put, you by the way, no transaction fee, none of that stuff. It's not a funny way to make money. It's $1 eats $1. 
And I know. it'd be cool to have walk around with a debit card that came, from, you know, shark focus. So, yeah. Well, I, I know there used to be some places that would only take cash, like the little kiosks that were in the middle. I mean, that's, that's right. I think that's a long time gone now with Wi Fi internet. But for a long time, like some of these would only be cash, which I never had cash on me. And I was always like, oh, you have the better beer and I want it and I can't get it. <laughs> and there's some people that, you know, prefer cash. We, and so we want to be able to handle them as well. But yeah, we're going to the contact list as much as we can, including ways that we can reduce lines and stuff like that. So that'll be not just for the season, but going forward. Cool. That's good insight. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, we've never heard of a reverse ATM before that. That's going to be something new for all of us. Yeah. To reverse ATMs and then they're ripping out the guts of the building and, and making it all modernized and like its own smart arena. What better place to do that than the hardest of looking Valley in San Jose. Exactly. So uh, good on you guys uh, for coming up with some new innovative ways to uh, get the, the fans to be able to pay for their, uh, their goods and their uh, food and everything else, their beer as as Aaron alluded to earlier there. So uh, Aaron, was there anything else you wanted to uh, ask him as long as we got, it seems like the later we keep him on, the more scoops he gives us. So <laughs> just keep asking more questions. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll tell you our next draft pick, but by the way, have you been watching our prospects? Yeah. I've seen on, I've seen highlights on Twitter. Yes. Did you see that Thomas Bordalo goal uh, in Michigan overtime against Wisconsin? Was that a, actually, I think that made sports center number one play of the day, didn't it? Yeah. Okay. Oh. The future. Yeah, no. I, I think the criticism from, uh, of course, the Twitter sphere being so negative uh, was that the the guy playing defense just kind of laid down. But I have a feeling that they wore him down before he had to lay down because yeah. it was a three on three overtime or something. So um, again, you know, it doesn't matter if he lays down or not. The guy's got good uh, hockey sense to drag that puck away from him, and uh, just a beautiful goal. So uh, congratulations to uh, Bordalo there. Uh, getting some highlights before the uh, the shark season uh, starts up. Do you think he's going to be one of those guys that really competes for a spot, or is uh, he going to continue on with uh, his career elsewhere for the time being? I think he'll probably be in Michigan for at least another year, um, but one never knows. By the way, the, do you remember the backstory of him? We got him with a 38th pick, and we actually traded down to take him, right? We had the 31st – no, 34th pick, I think it was, and yeah. we got 34 and 100 for him. So he was a guy we really had our eyes on but knew we could – Get him later in the draft. Smart. Doug Wilson Jr. is a very smart man. Yeah. We, the, the science of drafting is really interesting. One of these days we should eh, – and we can't really talk about it that much because then it would give away some of our competitive advantage. Right. We'll talk about so that. Interest, so interested in all of that stuff, though, like how all the trading and the phone calls and everything. And Aaron had talked about do they have like a bat phone and everything. So all that <laughs> stuff is just so interesting, you know. We have a bat phone and we have good old-fashioned cell phones. If you watch the coverage – you saw occasionally Doug Wilson Sr., the GM's phone ring. Most of the time, that's another team going, what about this? Oh, very good. Okay, well, Aaron, if that's – is that everything for you? You, you good? I yeah. think I'm good. You guys yeah. good? Okay. So, um, we – when we first jumped on here, and this is for our fans here, when we first jumped on uh, before we hit record with, with Jonathan here, um, he had teased us a little bit that he didn't have a Fin Factor T-shirt so Jonathan, we're going to fix that for you. Okay. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get you one of those shirts and we're going to give you uh, the full treatment, the Fin Factor Care Package, which wow. I get to keep a secret now too. I'm not telling you what's coming, but uh, you're, you're definitely going to like it. So uh, and look forward to that. If you don't mind, ship it to me to the SAP Center. I get to go in about once a week. Um, we're a non-essential business at the moment, so we're not working there, as you know. That I can do. No problem at all. Um, Aaron, any last thing here or are we good to go? No, we're good. Appreciate your time with us. Uh, uh, one heck of an interview with uh, president of the San Jose Sharks, Jonathan Becker. Jonathan, thank you again so much for popping in. Uh, I, I know it's a late night. We, we For the fans, we start our recordings at 9 o'clock at night, and uh, Jonathan was gracious enough to give us his time. Uh, so we do greatly appreciate that. Great okay. Being so thank for you. Super Producer Jason, I'm Paul. I'm Aaron. That was an interview with Jonathan Becker. Thank you guys for tuning in. We'll see you guys soon sometime soon maybe <laughs> bye 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 thanks for tuning in if you like this episode check out our other content especially interviews you can interact with us directly through social media at the fin factor and on instagram at fin factor and don't forget to join our live streams on youtube visit our website at thefinfactor.com where you'll find all of our episodes as videos or podcasts you'll also find our exclusive merchandise to help support our show